Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Leslie Salmon, and she's going to tell us about her experiences, but she's going to start us out with a Bible verse, correct? Yes, thank you, okay. Peggy. I wanted to read one of my favorite Bible verses. It's Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are all called according to his purpose. And I love that Bible verse because um, it came to mind when I read your book because you had so many traumatic experiences throughout your lifetime. And yet um, God took all of that and made something really miraculous and and created empathy in you and you became a professional and a mother who uh, used all those experiences to motivate you. So that's Thank one you. of the reasons why I like that Bible verse. And I, I refer to it personally in my own life a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still working on making change. And I'm starting today to actually write down some recommendations for the state child protection. So maybe we get some changes. So that's scary and exciting. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Because our case awesome. is finally being investigated. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Okay. Um, I do have some notes that I'm going to refer to just because so many of my experiences happened a long time ago. My out-of-body experiences and my um, near-death experiences, I remember very clearly. But the things that led up to them are a little murky. So I do have notes I'm going to refer to, but I'm not going to read from them because I know your viewers don't like people to come come on and and read from their books and things like that. So mostly I'm going to try to speak from the heart. Okay. So I think I'm going to start out by sharing that when I was a little girl, I suffered from severe anxiety and uh, nobody in my family really understood that or knew that. Um, I started getting debilitating panic attacks at ages 9, 10, and 11. And the physical symptoms, the worst physical symptoms were when um, my chest would seize up. Um, it would feel like my heart was hurting. It would feel like my lungs couldn't breathe. And sometimes I couldn't catch my breath. And when I would try to catch my breath, I would be in a great deal of pain. And so the anxiety and panic was then accompanied by me fearing that I was going to die because I was smart enough to understand that if you can't breathe, you can't live. So um, that just made the panic attacks worse. And Eventually, my parents took me to a doctor. I had EKGs, I had x-rays, I had blood work, I had a full exam. And the doctor said to my parents, there's nothing physically wrong with Leslie. She's well. Uh, we think this might be anxiety and not something physically wrong with her. Well, my parents were very relieved to hear that and so was I. Thank God, nothing is physically wrong. That's great news. And there was a little talk about, well, you know, what do you think is making you anxious? Well, I was too young to have any insight into that. I didn't have that kind of awareness at that age. So I thought, well, maybe the kids at school are making me anxious. Um, Cause there were a lot of times at school when I was anxious. But what I later figured out as I was older, um, I was anxious because there was stress and tension at home that was not being addressed and was not being resolved. And it was just ongoing. My parents had some stress in their marriage and um, my dad would frequently go into what we call bad moods. And um, it was very uncomfortable to be around him because he would become more critical and um, unpredictable in his behavior. So I never knew when my dad would be in a bad mood. And uh, 
I was a sensitive child. And so I developed this anxiety. Then the fear of death. But after being um, seen by a doctor and realizing that there's nothing physically wrong with me and I'm probably not going to die, that helped a little, but it didn't make my anxiety go away. And it didn't make my fear of death completely go away either. Now, I would talk to any adult who would listen <laughs> about my anxiety and stress and nervousness. Um, I talked to my sixth grade teacher about it. And um, one day, she decided to teach the whole class how to meditate. I don't think she was just doing that for me. Um, I think she wanted the whole class to learn how to manage stress and anxiety and stay calm so that we would be less likely to turn to drugs. So this was sixth grade. I was 12, 11 or 12. She taught us how to do a form of meditation that was quite simple. It started with um, a, a body awareness and a centering. And it also included some breath work and some visualization. And um, I did it one time and I loved it because I felt so good. Uh, and then I figured out this is going to help me manage my anxiety. And I figured that out all on my own. And um, as a sixth grader, just started meditating as she taught me to do anytime I needed relief from anxiety and I got pretty good at it and I was really glad to have that tool in my toolbox. Um, my parents never did take me to a counselor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist partly because it was 1975. People back then just didn't really take children to see specialists like that at least where I lived in northern Michigan which was somewhat remote. And there was also a stigma on mental health back then that I think my parents um, just didn't want to deal with. So I ended up just learning how to manage my anxiety by myself, which I think is a miracle. Um, one day I decided to go visit my grandma. I think I was about 14 years old and she had a Reader's Digest on her coffee table. I was bored, so I picked it up. And in this Reader's Digest magazine was a book review on Raymond Moody's Life After Life. And 14 years old, I thought, wow, that's interesting. So I read the book review. And I learned that he was a doctor. He was a researcher who studied life after life. What happens when people die? Since I had a fear of death, I, I wanted to know. And uh, I had the means and the whereabout to go to the bookstore and buy that book. I was just a kid. I didn't tell anybody I was buying it. What teenager goes to the bookstore to buy a book like that? And my family didn't know I bought it. So um, I read that book. <laughs> and that book really helped me deal with my fear of death. And it helped me understand um, that according to Raymond Moody and his research, there are people who experience life after death. Most of his research was on uh, near-death studies. So um, that was a real blessing for me to find that book. So as I um, went off to college, I had the ability to meditate and manage my anxiety and I also had an understanding of death, dying, near-death experiences, things like that. Um, and that was a real blessing for me. I enrolled in a college in my state of Michigan. It was a secular college. Um, right away, I got a boyfriend, but he was a senior. And he told me one day that he was accepted into graduate school at Notre Dame University. And, well, I kind of liked him, and I didn't want to be without him. So I decided I would go with him. 
So uh, Notre Dame is in South Bend, Indiana. Uh, there was no way my grades were good enough to get into Notre Dame. So I applied to the college that was across the street from Notre Dame and it was called St. Mary's College. It was an all woman's college and it was Catholic. I was not Catholic at the time. I was kind of agnostic, kind of nothing at the time. But um, I enrolled in that college, I moved there, and wouldn't you know it, I broke up with him shortly after we arrived. You know, I was a, a college kid wanting to have fun, and he was very studious and serious about uh, his graduate degree and advancing himself in a career, and so uh, we just all of a sudden weren't compatible. And I broke up with him and uh, found another boyfriend. But I was introduced to the Catholic faith at St. Mary's College. Um, and I was really surrounded by it. Every building had a crucifix. There were statues all over campus. Uh, mass was said every day. Every dorm had a chapel. Um, it was a very new environment for me. All my friends, uh, colleagues, roommates, they were all Catholic. Um, and there was something, you know, really attractive about being uh, in an environment that encouraged uh, God and Jesus and the saints and angels. I mean, it was a positive uh, environment, but I also didn't understand Catholicism very well. Uh, it was very different than uh, the way I was raised. And I started to learn about sin. Now, Catholics have something called the Sacrament of Reconciliation, which is going to confession. But I wasn't Catholic at the time. And I kept hearing about um, the sinful nature of human beings. And, you know, a lot of Catholics or former Catholics will tell you that the Catholic guilt is just more than they can take. A lot of people leave the church because they think there's too much emphasis on sin and guilt. But having an anxiety disorder uh, and, and starting to learn about my own sinful nature, which I never really uh, concerned myself with before, uh, started eating away at my nerves. I began to ruminate and have anxiety about my sinful nature. I decided I was selfish. I was a liar. Um, I'm not going to admit all my sins on your show, but you know, by the time you're in your early 20s, um, you've made a lot of mistakes and you've hurt a lot of people. And um, you know, there are consequences for sin. And I just started feeling really bad about myself. And it put me into a bit of a depression. And I felt some anxiety. So one day I said, you know what, I've got to return to meditation. I'm feeling too anxious and too depressed. I'm ruminating constantly about sin. So I lay down on my bed and I started that very simple body scan centering technique that my sixth grade teacher taught me. Um, I did get to a point where I was able to really calm my body and my mind and feel very relaxed. But there was something in the back of my mind saying, you know, this just isn't enough. You need to pray. And I thought, well, what would it be like to combine prayer with meditation? So I started to pray and I, I asked God to forgive me. Now there wasn't a whole lot of reference to Jesus at that time because I wasn't really a fully practicing Christian at that time, but um, I was praying to God, to the Holy Spirit, what have you, and asking him to forgive me, you know, admitting that I was a sinful person, telling him I was uh, really having a hard time with depression and anxiety and asking for his blessing and his grace. and. Um, I'm in this extremely relaxed, meditative state while praying. And then my body started to vibrate. And I, um, I just accepted that experience. It felt very comforting. It, it felt kind of like getting a massage. I don't really know how to explain that, but 
my entire body tingled and vibrated and the vibrating became more and more intense. Um, it was not uncomfortable, but it was a new sensation. Um, I also heard, I don't know how to explain the noise I heard, but it was kind of a buzzing, vibrating noise. It did not hurt my ears, um, but I could hear the vibration. And the vibration became more and more intense until I vibrated right out of my body. And the sensation was that the vibration out of my body led through my chest and, and led kind of up. At the same time, I felt like something was coming into my body as well, that a vibration entered my body. But I definitely felt myself vibrate out of my body and I went into a tunnel. And um, the tunnel was not pitch black. It was illuminated and it, um, I was comfortable and I was suspended. And there was somebody to my right who was protecting me and guiding me. This I just intuitively knew. I, I didn't get to see him. I didn't, I didn't think to turn to look at him because at the top of the tunnel was a light that was catching my attention. And I kept moving up that tunnel to where the light was. And um, finally, I stopped probably halfway, three quarter of the way through the tunnel, I stopped. Somebody stopped me um, and I was suspended very comfortably suspended, no anxiety, no stress, peace. I felt, I felt very much at peace. And then the light started spilling into the tunnel. And the light came toward me and I started feeling unconditional love. I was overwhelmed by the love of the light and the light also had incredibly intense compassion and mercy and everything good. And this unconditional love and compassion was so intense but didn't hurt. It, it radiated through me it enveloped me, it um, held me, and it was very strong. It was, it was almost like I can't take any more of this, but I could. <laughs> it was intense but gentle, and, and I knew it was God. I just knew that kind of love and compassion comes from God, and it was a healing. It was a healing for the guilt I was experiencing and the anxiety and the depression I had over my human sinful nature. It was a healing and um, it was beautiful. And it, I don't know how long it went on, but at some point it calmed down a bit and it spoke to me, the light spoke to me, God spoke to me. And he said two things. He said, remember the center of things and remember what controls things. Well, I understood. Now, mind you, he didn't have to say he loved me because I was feeling it. <laughs> but I, I understood that that light was the center of things. That light was the center of the universe. I, I understood that. But I didn't really understand what controls things. I thought I control things. <laughs> And I, I, didn't, I didn't really understand that, but I heard it. And at that point, I kind of started looking around this tunnel and I recognized where I was. I thought, wow, I read about this in Raymond Moody's book about life after life. People go into a tunnel, some people, <laughs> and some people say they see the light of God. And then I realized, I'm in that tunnel and there's that light 
and I must be dead. And that disturbed me for a minute. I was kind of upset about that for a minute, maybe a millisecond. Uh, as soon as that um, thought came to mind, I was uh, put right back in my body, just sucked back down that tunnel and hit my body pretty hard and uh, realized, wow, I was out of my body and I got a healing and I saw God and he gave me a message. <laughs> and I was only about 20. I'm 59 now. So, I mean, that tells you how long ago it was. And I remember it like it was yesterday. So the fortunate thing for me is I got out of my bed and I went to the phone uh, years ago. The, the phone was on the wall <laughs> and I called my boyfriend who was Catholic and I told him what happened to me and he, he believed me. He went ahead and listened to that and uh, he, he was supportive. But it, it ended up, he wasn't something he wanted to talk about all the time. I wanted to talk about it all the time. <laughs> I wanted to think about the meaning of that all the time. And of course, that's not, that was too much for him. Uh, so I went to see a priest. Um, I had a chapel in my dorm. Uh, there was a priest who had an office in my dorm. I went to see him and uh, I told him about my experience. And the first thing he asked me was, were you on drugs? I didn't do drugs. I didn't do drugs in college or ever, really. Um, were you drinking? Well, from time to time, I did have alcohol, but not that day. No. Uh, do you have a mental problem? Well, I was going through some depression and anxiety, but um, not enough really to, to provoke a psychotic break. And he really didn't have anything to offer me. And I was very disappointed about that. But because I read uh, Raymond Moody's book, I also knew that it's very common for clergy to be unprepared to deal with a person who has an out-of-body experience like that. So I forgave him. So that was my first um, out-of-body experience. And I told a therapist about it years later and she said, wow, you know, Buddhist monks study for years and years and years to learn how to do that. <laughs> she said, you just uh, seem to have a natural neck for that. Um, yeah, I guess so. Anyway, oh. I, um, do you have any questions about that? No, uh -uh. go ahead. Um, so the next spiritually transformative experience. Oh, first, let me say that when I came out of that, the gift from that was an undeniable belief in God. I knew God existed. And I also knew if my consciousness can exist outside of my body, then I don't fear death anymore. There is such a thing as life after death. So I'm only 20 years old and I came away from that experience with those gifts. There is a God and I don't fear death. And what a blessing and beautiful thing that has Which been. Is what you asked for was a blessing and grace. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so my next spiritually transformative experience was an NDE. And I can share with you a little bit about that NDE, but I need to warn your viewers. It's not a very dramatic exciting NDE like a lot of your viewers have. Um, well, we know it's not fake then, don't we? <laughs> right, right. So, um, you know, some people might think that this NDE is kind of disappointing, but um, I uh, was in labor with my daughter. <clears throat> my daughter is now 35 years old. So um, I, was, I was 23. And uh, my husband uh, was driving me to the hospital, and it was like a 45-minute drive to the hospital. And when we got in the car, I just looked around at the environment, and I thought, wow, what a beautiful day. <clears throat> I've never seen the sky so blue. I've never seen the trees so green and the grass so green, and 
everything just seems to be sparkling and there's not a cloud in the sky and the birds are singing and I just couldn't get over the beauty of the day and the light in the day. And I would, you know, my husband's driving, I would say, don't you see this beautiful day? What do you think? It's just April. So in Michigan, uh, northern Michigan, where I was, sometimes April is still a little snowy and cloudy and cold. But that's not how it seemed to me that day. So I was in a lot of pain uh, driving to the hospital, but I couldn't help noticing that everything was so pretty and light and beautiful. And honestly, it gave me a sense of peace to see the colors of the the flowers that were coming up and the grass and the trees and the sky. Um, so we get to the hospital. Uh, and during my labor and delivery, I still think it's beautiful. I, I'm seeing white light all around the room and there's a window and I keep looking out the window thinking, what a beautiful day. And I keep talking about it to the nurses and, and whoever would listen and nobody really saw the beautiful day that I saw. I had a normal labor and delivery and uh, delivered a perfectly healthy uh, little girl, and, you know, was completely in love with her from, from the start. And, uh, you know, right away put her to my breast and uh, started the bonding process with her. However, in the midst of all that, I started feeling more pressure down between my legs. And I called a nurse and I said, I've got pressure down there. Something's not right. And she said, well, let me look. Maybe you're having twins. This is back before the days of routine sonograms. Sometimes there were twins. So she looked down between my legs and she said, you're not having another baby. You have a massive hematoma. You're losing blood. You're bleeding internally. So that kind of changed things. Uh, she had to go get the doctor. He came back and he said he was going to have to do surgery and that I was going to probably need blood transfusions, and that this was pretty serious. And um, now, mind you, I don't fear death, so that's a blessing. I believe in a, a living God uh, who speaks to me, so that's a blessing. I read Raymond Moody's book, and I, I read about accounts of heaven, and, and I'm hoping that I'll get to go to heaven. So I'm not really afraid of death, even though I'm only 23. But what did cause me concern was my new baby. I thought, okay, uh, I guess my husband and his parents will have to raise the baby. And maybe my parents will get to visit and take part in some way in raising the baby too. And I just thought about that and I thought, I, I don't know if that's what I want for her. Um, so I had to contemplate that as I was getting ready for surgery. Um, thinking about what would happen to my daughter started making me a little nervous, and I asked for a sedative. So I was given Ativan, and it did kind of calm me down a little bit, and uh, I went off to surgery. When I came out of surgery, I was in a recovery room that looked to me to be filled with white light. It was a, a white recovery room. I didn't see any emergency equipment or medical equipment. I didn't see oxygen tanks or any kind of medical tools. It was just like this lovely white room and I'm laying on a bed just trying to come to, and um, a beautiful nurse was leaning over me. I saw this nurse. She was trying to wake me up. As soon as I saw her, I instantly felt love. And I said, are you an angel? I thought I had died. I thought I was in heaven. I thought she was an angel. And I didn't have a care in the world. 
I didn't care what happened to me. I didn't care what was going on with my family or my daughter. I knew I was in heaven and that was an angel. And she said, no, honey, I'm a nurse. And she said, you just had a baby. And then, oh, that memory of everything that happened came back to me. Now I'm feeling peace and love and joy, and I'm surrounded by this light. I'm not feeling any physical pain, and I'm not aware of being weak. And I think, well, this is an odd sensation. Maybe it's because of the anesthesia or, or the medication. Maybe, um, maybe that's how it feels when you come out of getting an operation. Maybe you're just full of love and happiness and and plus, I was a new mother. Of course, I was going to be filled with love and happiness and joy. So anyway, the nurse rolls me uh, down the hallway to a nursery. And uh, she points out my daughter to me. And, I, and that was, you know, another bonding moment that I'll never forget. And I'm still just basking in this glow that I can't explain. And at the time, I just thought, well, it's the oxytocin. It's, it's the hormonal change that the mother goes through. And this is the joy mothers feel when they have a baby. So I eventually took my daughter to uh, a hospital room and started uh, to learn how to breastfeed her and just had to spend some time at the hospital. The whole time that light is with me, the joy, the peace. And I'm attributing all those feelings to, to being blessed with a daughter and being a mother and thinking, man, this is just wonderful. And that feeling stayed with me probably a month or two. Wow. So um, the reason I believe I had a near-death experience, obviously I was near death. I had to have an operation. I had three blood transfusions. I didn't get a life review. Don't remember talking to anybody or seeing anybody. But I believe I really had a special blessing with all that beautiful white light and all those feelings of joy and love and happiness that I later found out is not part of anesthesia. I've had other operations and procedures. I usually wake up feeling pretty sick and miserable. <laughs> um, and I, I'm not full up with love for everybody in the room either. I'm usually pretty mad about being in pain. Um, so I look back on that and I think that was an NDE and I was not granted any memory of, of that, but I can only imagine that God said to me, this, this is an opportunity for you to exit your body, to leave this world. Um, but what about your daughter? I can only imagine he said that to me because when I came back, I had a complete and total personality change. I became a very dedicated, loving mother. I became a very, a much less unselfish person. I became very focused on helping people and loving others. So these are some of the after effects that I hear other um, NDE experiencers um, go through. You know, so at the time, I didn't know what to think of it. Now, looking back on it, I was blessed. I was blessed during that NDE. I did have another um, daughter. Uh, two years later, I gave birth to another daughter. I love her. It was a joyful experience to have another baby. But there was no white light. There was no love for all the nurses. And, and uh, there was a lot of discomfort and pain. Totally different experience, which I think... Uh, is probably a more normal childbirth experience. <laughs> so that was my NDE, not too flashy, not too dramatic, but the after effects um, left me very open and empathic and loving. And um, unfortunately, just like many other people who have NDEs, my relationship started to suffer. And mostly that was because um, I wanted my husband to grow the way I had. I wanted him to be as open and loving and unselfish as I was trying to be. And um, we definitely were not on the same page. I was definitely a different woman after that. Um, 
than the woman he knew, who was a bit more focused on materialism and having fun and the experience of the flesh. Um, I was a much more spiritual person and um, not a perfect person by any means because I became extremely impatient with him and, uh, and his flaws. Um, so, um, you know, I had flaws too, <laughs> but I became very impatient with him. And I've heard that from other uh, people who go through NDEs that, um, that the marriage suffers. So. Okay. So you had another OB? OBE after yeah. that? I did. Um, so um, my next OBE happened, uh, I'm going to say, five or six years after that near-death experience. So at that time, I was a divorced single mother. I recently moved to a new town and I um, had my first full-time job as a mental health counselor. I uh, got my own home, um, my own full-time job, uh, daycare for my kids, and um, was just trying to live my life. Um, but it, it didn't take long for me to become stressed and overwhelmed being uh, a single mother also, I was not co-parenting well with the father of my children. We did not have the kind of relationship where we were cooperating and always trying to keep the children's best interest at heart. And I mean, there was a lot of arguing about visitation and custody and um, we didn't do a good job back then. And um, I lived far away from friends and family. I moved there for this job, but it turns out the job ended up being uh, very overwhelming. I was also diagnosed with a thyroid disorder at that time. So I, I started to become depressed from the stress. Um, it wasn't the same kind of depression I felt when I was ruminating over guilt and anxiety. It, it wasn't as strong as that, but it was still significant and I was worried about how I would function as a full-time worker, as a mother, as, as just a woman. Um, so um, you'd think I would know what to do. I was a mental health counselor. Um, you know, I could have gone to see a therapist myself. I could have um, gone to see a doctor, maybe tried some antidepressants. Um, but there was a reason why I didn't do that. So I didn't reach out for professional help because I was afraid that if I had a mental health diagnosis and was on medication, that there would be a possibility that that could be used against me in court and that the custody of my children might be jeopardized. Now, back then, uh, this was in the mid 80s, uh, late 80s, I knew people who went through that. I knew people who were trying to get help for substance abuse or mental health issues, trying to better themselves. And that ended up getting used against them in court. So somebody would would get a court order and records would be um, taken to court and that person's whole business would be spilled out and they would be declared unfit because they have a mental health issue and they can't have their children now. The custody goes to the other parent. I, I didn't want that to happen to me. Now let me say, I don't think that would happen these days. I don't but think I so. When I worked for child protection in the 90s, I remember one day, so strange, we got a call from a judge that was doing a social security hearing. And he called and said, this lady is in here saying 
Her psychological problems are so bad, she can't function, so she shouldn't have her kids. He was calling in a complaint to say she shouldn't have her children based on that she had filed for Social Security. I just stuck with me. It's like, wow, that seems like such a knife in the back. Right. So probably she had a problem that prevented her from holding down a job. Right. From being a parent. Yeah. And there are so many different ways to be parents. I mean, you can be, you can be a parent who has grandparents helping you. You can be a a parent. They even have therapeutic daycare now for uh, parents who need breaks from their kids. So yeah, that's, that's sad. That said, but anyway, I don't think these days that something like that would happen. I don't think a, a depressed person who goes on um, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor medication is thought to be unable to care for children. But back then things were different. And also I was kind of paranoid and I wasn't getting along with my children's father. So the depression was um, getting worse and I was getting kind of scared about it. And uh, let me say, my kids were fine. I, I was still going to work. I was still buying groceries. Everybody was okay. <laughs> but I was just scared. I was just scared it would get worse. So um, I, I laid down to meditate on that. And um, <clears throat> this meditation led me to kind of fall asleep, kind of go into a dreamlike state. Uh, but I did leave my body again. And in this um, out of body experience, I was accompanied by a guardian angel or a guide and by an another companion who appeared to just be a normal person. And in this dream, we are flying. We are flying over a beautiful landscape, hills, mountains, valleys, meadows, streams, waterfalls, crystal clear blue rivers, lakes, oceans, lots of waterfalls, um, beautiful colors. It, it looked like the rainforest, but in a perfected state. Of course, I had never seen the rainforest. I didn't know what I was looking at. I mean, it was just absolutely beautiful. And as we were flying, I'm, I'm taking in this beautiful view and, and looking at the flowers. I was very um, taken by by red flowers that were in the trees and anything I was really interested in, I would focus on an intense focus like a camera lens. But it was, it was indescribably beautiful. Um, and as I was flying, I was experiencing a healing. I became lighter and lighter and lighter and the depression was flying off of me, just coming off of me. I don't know how else to explain it. It, it was disappearing. The more I flew, the more I took in this beauty. And I felt very secure with the guardian angel or guide who was to my right. I, I felt very protected by him and I kind of recognized him. I knew he was there in my first OBE in the tunnel. Now, I, I wasn't allowed to turn my head. I couldn't see him, but I knew he was there. But the companion to my right, or to my left, I was in the middle. There was the angel, then me, and then a companion to my left. He was the one. I, I, I thought, who's that? I knew he wasn't an angel. As soon as I said, who, who am I flying with? Who is that? He turned his head to look at me and I looked right at him and I saw the outline of his face. I saw his eyes, his nose, everything, his mouth, the kind of hair he had. Um, I took in his whole face and, and he, he had a pleasant face and uh, he kind of smiled 
And I smiled at him and I just thought, well, I, I don't know who that is. And then he turned away and so did I. And we went back to admiring the beauty beneath us and we finished this flight. And uh, eventually I ended up back in my body. And it was, again, it was like, boom, you know, kind of a start when I'm back in my body. And I woke up and I knew I had been healed. There was no depression, no anxiety, no worries. I was filled with hope. And um, in the coming days, I would check myself. Are you feeling hopeless today? Are you feeling sad? Are you irritable? Um, are you grouchy? Are you, do you feel like you're gonna cry? No, no. The depression was absolutely gone and there was a hope that the future would be better. And I was very relieved. And I would say oh, several months after I had that out of body experience, that was like a, a dreamlike vision. I moved to a new town and um, I met a man who um, I started dating and I, I enjoyed his company. And uh, one day we went out to uh, dinner, had a few drinks and he looked at me and he said, do you ever have flying dreams? And I recognized him. He, he was the companion who was flying with my guardian angel and me. He was in that flying dream. I recognized him. And I looked right at him and I said, I've had one flying dream and you were in it. <laughs> he believed me. He went ahead and he accepted that, you know. Here again, you know, we didn't spend a whole lot of time talking about it, but he let me say it. He didn't say you're crazy. But he told me, you know, he said, I have flying dreams quite often and I really love them. So right then and there, I figured he must be my soulmate and I'm probably going to marry him. And I did marry him. <laughs> and I was married to him for 16 years. Um, he helped me raise my children. Is that um, your first husband? My second. Okay. His second husband. Um, he, uh, he and I adopted a third child together. And uh, we had a lot of good years and some not so good years. Uh, there were a lot of lessons learned and um, it, it, was a, it was a good companionship. But there's no fairy tale ending here. And uh, what happened is a problem came up that was bigger than either one of us could handle. It was unexpected. Um, and it was too big. It was too big for us at the time. And uh, for me, the, the, the best thing to do was, was to move on and get a divorce. And this was something I was very sad about and very angry about. And, uh, you know, wondered why I would be given the gift of a dream uh, where I meet him. <laughs> and then later on, something so big happens that I can't handle it and, and we have to divorce. Um, you know, that it's really hard. This was my second divorce. Well, you adopted, so maybe that was meant to be. The baby was adopted. Yeah, we adopted a child together, yes. I think there were... I think our faith traditions teach us that, that we shouldn't get divorced. Our culture uh, is against divorce. Society tells us we shouldn't get divorced. We get all these messages about how bad divorce is for children. Um, but divorce does seem to be in some people's life path. And it's, uh, it's hard to understand. With me, after my marriage of 16 years, I realized I deserved to be loved. And I was going to go find that. And if I had to get divorced to do it, and that's what was going to happen. <laughs> so that's what I did. And you found love. Yeah. Yeah, found my soulmate. We've been married 25 years so far. And that's beautiful. That's just really, really beautiful. He worships the ground I walk on. <laughs> well... 
<laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> I can see, I can see that you are well loved. You're well loved by God. You're well loved by um, your husband and, and by your children and grandchildren. And uh, I can see that. And it just, it shines through you, Peggy. Yeah, they mean a lot to me. You learn that love's everything, you know, when you've went so far without it. And you really, uh, you know, you get it and you don't, you don't mistreat it. <laughs> And I'm sure you're a wonderful wife. I'm pretty spoiled. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we recently retired, so we're kind of enjoying that. I'm so happy for you. And in your retirement, you get to work on this project, which reaches out to thousands of people. Yeah. And I, don't like, doing it every, yeah, I don't like doing it every day. It becomes a job. I like for it to be a treat. So I slowed it down and, you know. Do it you know, a couple a week and just enjoy it because I just don't want it to be a job. I don't want to get stressed out with it and get overwhelmed and anxiety. And so do it at my own pace. And I love that about you. I love your laid back style. And I, I love your sort of um, the, the way you interview people it seems a little bit more like a discussion than an actual interview. <laughs> well, as you know, you really can't separate the counselor. Even though I haven't, you know, worked in the field of social work and counseling in years, you just, it just becomes ingrained in you. It's one of those jobs that you just, you just, everywhere you go, you're constantly counseling people, <laughs> yeah. investigating yeah. thing. And so I've got a friend who's a nurse and uh, she said, once you're a nurse, you're always a nurse. Even after you retire, you don't stop being a nurse. So I think it's the same for counselors as well. Um, I did get a chance to meet that guardian angel, if you want to hear about that. Sure. Um, last year, I uh, drove from my home in Little Rock, Arkansas, to Chicago, Illinois, because my daughter was uh, having a home birth. And she gave birth to my third grandson. And she just needed an extra pair of adult hands around the house to help with uh, the other two boys as she recovered from the birth. And uh, I did a lot of babysitting and I was very tired, you know, exhausted. Um, it, it was a little nerve wracking too. Uh, I know home births are perfectly safe, but uh, you know, I was nervous about it. But anyway, um, I was having a bit of a hard time sleeping and I thought I'm gonna do a little light meditation. I try not to do heavy <laughs> meditation too often because um, I don't necessarily feel like I'm called to be go going out of my body all the time. You know what I mean? Um, it seems to be something that happens easily with me. But I did a little light meditation and fell asleep and had a dreamlike vision of myself, my daughter, and my brother in a wooden boat with my guardian angel or my guide. So the atmosphere we're in is serene and peaceful, but kind of dark, like the sun just went down. And there's a waterfall and beautiful vegetation and swans swimming around. And it, it's just a lovely moonlit scene. We're in a, a lovely pond. And uh, I'm I'm not sure of the symbolism of the boat. I'm really not sure of anything. I'm, I'm not even really sure of uh, why there was an appearance of my daughter and, and my brother. But my guardian angel was sitting to my right. He, he always seems to be at my right. And um, I recognized him, and he, he took on a form for me, and I was allowed to look at him. And that was really beautiful. But... Um, he had a lot of love and, and kindness, but he had a mission and he wanted to heal me from something. And so he drew close to me and he took his hands and he hovered them over my abdomen. And I felt a vibration and a tingling sensation in my abdomen and I knew it was a healing. I just, I intuitively, instinctively, knew I was being healed. 
and um, I thanked my guardian angel and uh, came out of that vision and woke up. And the first thought to my mind was, wow, I've been healed. Um, I, I didn't know I needed a healing. I didn't know there was any. I assumed that because he ran his uh, hands, hovered his hands over my abdomen, I assumed there was some kind of sickness in my abdomen. So I thought, well, you know, whatever's wrong with me, I'm not going to worry about it because he healed me. So I finished uh, babysitting my grandchildren, and eventually I left Chicago, came back home to Little Rock, Arkansas. And... um, Like about a week after I got home, I came down with a UTI and it was so painful. I could hardly stand up and I could hardly walk. Um, It was also accompanied by just severe abdominal muscle pains. Uh, I felt like I did 100 sit-ups, 200 sit-ups. That's how my abdomen felt. I went to the doctor and I did get some medicine, uh, and it, but it was pretty intense suffering. And I thought, why is this happening? I got a healing. I got a healing. Why is this happening? But then it occurred to me, it just kind of popped in my head. The timeline in heaven, God's timeline is different than our timeline, than earthly timeline. I got the healing. It just came before the physical symptoms have happened. So, um, yeah, I was healed from that. It didn't take long with the medicine and some rest for, for me to be healed from that UTI. Um, so I think what happened is my guardian angel knew this was coming. He healed me. Just I don't understand the timeline. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I I said to my husband, you know, why do you think my brother and my my, um, daughter were in that boat with my guardian angel and me? And what came to him was that my brother, that particular daughter, and myself are the only people in our immediate family who have procreated and have biological children. Um, and he thought maybe it could be a different kind of healing, um, some type of ancestral healing. Um, I watched one of your podcasts. You had a guest talking about ancestral healing, that, that you can receive a healing that affects yourself as well as future generations and maybe even past generations because we don't understand time right. and how it all works. And so my husband was suggesting maybe it was some type of uh, ancestral genetic kind of healing. So I'll never know. But uh, that, was, that was a wonderful experience to meet my guardian angel. I imagine you're a big help to spiritual people in your counseling sessions that you wouldn't be like the priest and, oh, that was just something off, you know, that didn't happen or whatever. Like when he yes. asked you, was it, was it uh, drugs or was it alcohol or, you know, mental health problem? And- so I've, I've counseled hundreds of people over the years, um, hundreds and hundreds of people over the years, and only one person disclosed to me that she had a near-death experience. And um, I was able to validate her experience and listen, and she appreciated that. And, um, you know, I helped her incorporate and integrate that experience uh, into her life, and that was quite a pleasure. But that was just one person. And I think... I was involved so much in solution focused counseling for most of my career um, that there just wasn't the permission, I think, for people to bring that up. I don't think they felt very comfortable. I was either working in 
drug and alcohol clinics or child welfare um, organizations or uh, mental health clinics. And we had to sort of uh, treat them and street them. You know what I mean? I, but eventually, um, I, I left that kind of um, organized clinic agency um, approach to counseling, and now I have a private practice. And I, I would love to have um, clients who um, would feel comfortable sharing their spiritually transformative experiences with me because I think I could help them integrate that experience into their marriage, into their lifestyle. Um, a lot of times these NDEs and OBEs seem to be very healing, but sometimes the trauma that um, brings these experiences on lingers and people still need to do some trauma work um, and, and resolve the trauma that is still affecting them. So um, I work with people who have experienced trauma, depression, anxiety, grief, loss, and I am very open-minded to people who've had unusual um, spiritual experiences. Uh, I think these kinds of things happen frequently, and people just don't feel like their stories will be well-received, so they keep them to themselves. Um. Almost two years ago, I had a little OBE when I was really sick and I passed out, hit the floor and I had this little OB, tiny little OBE. I was just like between my body and the wall and there was these people talking. I could hear, I'm like, what, what are you saying? What are you saying? And it was just really short. But when I tried talking about it on Facebook, I had several NDE friends that kind of, I felt like they thought she's lying. You know, these are supposed to be our, this is supposed to be our support system. Like she's already had two NDEs. What? She wants another? I'm like, I want an NDE. I'm just saying this little weird, tiny little OBE thing just happened. And I just want to talk about it. I'm really, it's really altered my whole perception because I know what that five-year-old drowning NDE was like. I know what the 25, and now I've had this recent thing at 60 and it's just so tiny that it's really change how I'm having a good time it was like a big party and they uh, aside their voices like they were so close together everybody's social distancing at the time you know and it seemed like they were just so close and you could kind of hear the height of the voices and the male and the female and this huge party and I was really like curiosity killed a cat I wanted to step over and like mm -hmm. see what all these people in heaven are talking about and what they're doing but yet I felt like you know, curiosity killed the cat. You need to listen to your husband who's trying to bring you back. He's like, baby, baby, you know, and I'm like, I better listen to him. So that's what I did. But it really changed my view of the afterlife because I've heard so many people talk about these wonderful having experiences. I didn't have that. You know, I had the drowning as I'll out of body, this ghost girl. And then at 25, I was screaming mad. I got to I can't be here. Like, hell no, I won't go. I got kids to raise. And so this fun little party, little snippet, just totally, like, it brought me joy. Like, yeah. the, is that what it's going to be like? Because I hadn't experienced that. I've heard other people's, but I hadn't experienced. And so well, I got this enthusiasm for heaven now, because, like, I want to go to that party. <laughs> so, and I've heard of other people saying that they had parades and parties and welcoming committees and you got a tiny glimpse of that, what, for maybe a minute or? And what my husband said, you were not that long, even. It was just, you know, seconds. Mm -hmm. um, and he, my, he said, my eyes was fluttering and he couldn't get me to come to. And as soon as he come, I come to, I was like, there was these people talking and I was right here in between. You know, it was just like this whole thing. And then I was so sick, you know, I had to go back to bed. But then I woke up in the middle of the night. And I thought, should I go back to the bathroom? And like, am I going to be sick? And um, something just like told me, you stay put. Go to the hospital in the morning. Because if I go in there and pass out and fall in, you know, and go to this out of body, he's not going to be there to shake me. 
Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, I was that sick. I mean, I've been sick a lot. Like, where I, I mean, I have irritable bowel. Like, I just shoot out both ends and I pass out. That's my normal. Passing out is normal. I used to do it two, three times a week when my 20s when I was under a lot of stress. But, you know, not so much anymore. But so that was the only time I ever had an experience. All oh, the hundreds of times I passed out. It's the only time I've had an experience. And it was because I was sitting up. He, and I was like, I'm going to lay down on the floor because I know I'm going to pass out. I lay on the floor. And he says, don't lay on that cold floor again tonight. Let me get you a blanket. So I had to sit there and wait. And I thought, I'm going to pass out before he gets back. Next thing I know, I'm on the floor. But but yeah, it's just like, floor, oh, and you, heard you, there. you <laughs> left for just a minute, got a little taste of what that's like. Yeah, they were having a ball. I mean, that's chatter, amazing. chatter, chatter at once. That's amazing. They were happy to see you. I don't know if they saw me. I kind of felt like if you entered, just entered this really crowded party and like nobody knew you were supposed to, you weren't supposed to be there. Or there were so many people that didn't even notice you. I didn't feel like, I was, except for there was one woman's voice. I felt like she was talking to me directly because like her voice seemed louder in my ear. And so I was like, huh? What'd you say? Huh? What? What? And I thought, and something just kind of, I just kind of this knowing like, if you really want to know, like you can go. But if you want to stay, you better start listening to your husband's voice and, and get my way back. And so that's what I did. But yeah, it was just a little thing, but it was just like, it just surprised me that I had no support. Like I didn't want this big applause. Oh, wow, this happened to you. Cause it was just a tiny little thing. I just want to discuss it. And people like, they kind of act like you already had two, you don't get no more. You know, <laughs> you got all the attention you're going to get. And it wasn't about attention. And so I thought we really haven't come as far as I thought in supporting each other with the experiences. Because well, I know, there's still a lot. I of- know times when I read the comments um, for your shows and other shows that sometimes people are really critical, rude, rude and, um, you know, gosh, that's, we're not doing this to generate a bunch of negativity. <laughs> We're trying right. to inspire people because, you know, not everybody has has these kind of experiences. Um, I believe that that everybody's going to get to go to heaven. Everybody's going to get to see God. Everybody's going to have opportunity to be at peace and go beautiful places. I think that's for everybody. But I think um, only some people seem to be able to do that uh, through meditation or NDEs. Um, And I think, well, why? I don't know why some people get that and other people don't. But I don't know, why do some people play the piano beautifully and other people don't? You know what I mean? Why? Why are some people, um, you know, really good at math and other people aren't? We all have different abilities and different tendencies, different ways that we operate. I just happen to be somebody, and and you too, who uh, leaves their body pretty easily and uh, has discovered our consciousness exists beyond the body. Um, Do I think anybody can do this? Yeah, I do. But on, you know, everybody has their own unique skill set and their own unique abilities. Um, I just want to put that out there, you know. And and I don't want people to, I I, I feel very sad when when people criticize others who have these uh, unique experiences that maybe they don't or they don't understand. Yeah, sometimes I'll just go ahead and delete that stuff just to keep that negativity off there. It's not that I don't want anybody to say anything bad about my channel. It's because I used to dispute stuff and I do once in a while. But usually I'll just because what happens what you know, you can have a hundred people say, Oh, I love this, and you get one person, I don't like it, and then they get a little thread going, you know what? I really didn't either. It's just like a negativity, it's like everybody wants to pile on. And um or especially if it's negative towards my guests. I'm like, well, they don't need to read that. I'll just take it off. But I yeah. think about when you're in the E, when you had that light beforehand and how it stayed with you. And it just seems like you're susceptible 
too, noticing that where the light could be around that next patient too, but they have no knowledge is there. And I think some of just have that um, pick up on those perceptions is like the veil is thinner for us. Yes. For whatever reason, it's not because we're special or anything like that. It just um, is, it might have something to do with our brain chemistry. I don't know. Um, I read something about a lady who could remember everything all the time. She could remember what she had for lunch 25 years ago, what she wore at the lunch, where she was when she had the lunch, what was on her plate. She can remember everything. And uh, she had a brain scan and it was discovered that that part of the brain uh, responsible for that long-term kind of detailed memory in her is bigger than in other people. Maybe our brain has some type of sixth sense. I don't know. I used to, and I didn't think about it at the time that it was anything unusual, but if I'd hear a song one time on the radio, the next time I heard it, I'd be singing every word. Or somebody would talk about something that happened way in the past, and I remember it, and I would tell the conversation word for word for word. I couldn't tell you what they were wearing or what year or what month it was, but I could t- I'll tell you word for word everything was said in a conversation. And then I realized that one of my sons is the same way. His wife started telling me, well, he's the same way. I'm like, huh, well, maybe it's just some kind of inherited trait. But I'm yeah. just not to be the only one in my family that has it. And then my son seems to be that way, too. And he's very sensitive, like I was as a child. So I was, too. I was extremely sensitive. I had a lot of uh, deja vu experiences. And um, my mother and my dad both told me what deja vu meant. And one day it occurred to me, um, hey, if I feel like I've been through this before or I know this circumstance, um, maybe I can predict what's coming next. And then I started doing that. And I told my parents, um, well, my deja vu has turned into knowing what's going to come next. And boy, did they discourage that. They told me that that would not be good for me. Nobody should know the future. Wouldn't it be stressful to know when you're going to die? So I just kind of turned that off. (laughs) A few weeks ago, I was rare. I woke up. I just started to doze off. And all of a sudden, I woke up and I said, "Um, there's going to be a Black Friday Walmart shooter. It's just Mm -hmm. like, like right now. Like, I just like Black Friday Walmart shooter. Just those words was just like, when I sat up. The next morning I got up and started reading. It wasn't Black Friday yet, though, but that Walmart shooting. And so I got really nervous about the Black Friday coming up. And there was some threats and and one shooting and, you know, Mm -hmm. but I mean, I was praying, God, don't let there be a Black Friday, you know, Walmart shoot. We've had enough going on. But it was just like shocking when I seen and I thought, but it wasn't Black Friday, you know. But then, you know, sometimes I'll get feelings before school shootings. I'm like, it's going, I don't know where it's happening at. It's mm-hmm. going to happen today. And I'll just know it. I, I can feel it coming. It's like, it's coming. Like maybe this week, maybe today. Like I feel yeah. it. It's like, it's in the air. Like it's yeah. coming. And I think when we have a premonition or we know that something like that is going to happen, or sometimes, you know, people have dreams about these things. That's an opportunity for us to pray. Yeah. And to get other people who are believers involved in praying and, and maybe our own intentions can um, and prayers can uh, help create a, a different reality. Um, but even if something bad does happen, I fall back to Romans 8:28. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. So even when trauma and tragedy occurs, God is going to use that somehow. Um, and so I don't feel hopeless when when things like that happen. Have you seen the movie Cokeville Miracle? No. no. Yeah, I looked at it. Cokeville Miracle. Okay. It's a true story, and it's an older movie. It's kind of like before it's time. Because um, it was a true story about this man went in with his mom and his wife and they were going to like, you know, do this destruction at this elementary. And the thing was, is after it all was over with, the children started reporting to their parents. They all saw an angel there. And a couple of them pointed out photo albums that happened to be their great grandmother, their grandmother, something like that. 
And the way that the thing exploded and the way it all happened is like, it's a miracle in so many different ways that this didn't happen and that didn't happen, that everybody was okay. Other than the people that went in to do it, they weren't, <laughs> they died in it. But um, it's just really makes you stop and think about listening to children. Because, mm-hmm. you know, they was all afraid to tell their parents, mm-hmm. afraid they would be believed just like us adults are. Mm-hmm. And, and they're all stories all coincided. They, they all seen us white light come a form around them. They seen your guardian angels. They each had their own. And some of them were told to get up and move to the other side of the room right before the blast and those kind of things. So, but the thing was too, that the kids, they all pray. They all started praying before all this all, you know, took a nosedive, you know, they all, the kids start on their own, start praying. So, I mean, the power of prayer. What a good movie. Yeah. So I appreciate your time. Is there anything else that you'd like to add or read it cover? Um, you told me, or you told your viewers more than once about a time when you, um, you were, I think when you were 25 and you had a NDE and you were arguing and you were angry and you were mad. Mm -hmm. So I had a dreamlike vision uh, a few years ago where I was um, taken to a place. Uh, My body was put on a marble slab. I was comfortable. And there were these really heavenly beings, there were about seven, three on each side of me and one at my head, giving me an energy healing. They were healing me from something. And uh, after the healing was done, I got up off this marble bed and I, I spoke to them. And I realized that while I was with them and while I was there, I had all the knowledge of the world, of the universe, and I knew things and I knew my purpose on earth. And I was so happy and thrilled to know what my purpose on earth was. And um, the the man I was talking to, I mean, they were all lovely, beautiful, loving beings. Um, I said, I thank you for sharing my purpose with me. It's gonna make my life on earth so much easier. I'm so relieved. And he said, you can't take this knowledge with you. And then I got mad. What do you mean I can't take this knowledge with me? My life on earth is very difficult, very stressful. I'm anxious all the time. I have so much work to do. I I never know if I'm doing the right thing. I'm always second guessing myself. But you just told me my purpose. If I can take that back with me, I will be filled with confidence. I will be able to complete my mission with ease. And I was mad he wouldn't let me bring it back. So when I came to or woke up, I ran and got a pen and paper. And I'm like, I am going to remember this. And I started writing and forgot everything, everything but the healing experience. (laughs) You know, I would never have the in the ears that talk about aliens and spaceships and you know, those kind of things on my show. That's just not, you know, the direction I would want to go, but there is, and I don't talk very often about very often. There is to me an alien kind of intelligence in these experiences, because what we see on TV as this, and I don't watch much of that stuff, but I remember my Star Trek days when I was a kid. My brother would have an after school. And um, there's this such a high tech to it where, you know, Sunday school, you read about the Bible and you think everything's so ancient and long ago. But when you have these experiences, you start to get this sense of this high intelligence that is co-working in our lives. And that it is, you know, so many people think, oh, you believe in God and that Bible, that stuff's so old and like, no, you don't get it. This is high tech, like beyond the high tech you will ever see in your lifetime. They, they are so high tech over there. I mean, the, the way they can take a memory 
you know, say five years old, they're drowning. All of a sudden, I see this memory uh, looking in this fishbowl. I'm like, why are they afraid? You know, why aren't they afraid of that treasure chest? You know, it was, I felt like it was God's way of saying, you know, oh, because I'm like, oh, the fish knows something I don't. I'm dead. They knew the difference between something alive and dead, and I, I don't, you know. Like, oh, I'm dead. And so it's like it was used to get me to realize, girl, you're dead. <laughs> you're not. Because at first, when I first, you know, the struggling was over, I was thinking, oh, my parents lied to me. There's no such thing as drowning. I can breathe. I'm fine. And then it's like, I know you're dead. They're like, oh, well, I might as well get out of here because I don't want to be a dead girl bomb this pond. Otherwise, maybe I would have stayed down there. And that would have been the extent of my ND. And to eat. But once that little fishbowl memory popped in and taught me I'm dead, I'm like, well, I might as well, you know, go up and well, if I could hover, I guess I can fly. I'll get, you know, and it just kind of went on. And and then, you know, the second NDE, when um I go with Jesus and we drop down and see my boys in the future, if I didn't return, because I said, you know, my boys would be better off without me for a reason. You know, I beg to go back. Um, if if they would be better off with me, then you know, I beg to go back. If they would be better off without me, then I agree to stay. And I was shown the future, and that confused me for decades because how could I be shown the future if I didn't come back? That made no sense to me because there's past, present, future. I think, and I didn't understand a world where you could see a future if you had died. And, and when God knows, he's going to send you back because he knows everything. But I really felt like it wasn't decided yet. And mm. so I thought, and so it's all that time and place stuff. And, yes. And Very confusing. You know, yeah. And then scenes open up and it's like, oh, I get it. Or these voices come in and tell us things. And um, there's an, it's like there's intelligence all around us in these guardian angels and they're constantly there when you need them. And then, you know, I know bad things happen to people. And they say, well, where was their guardian angel? You know, why didn't God save them? And, you know, I don't have answers. But, you know, it seems like everything has a plan. And, and but yet, I don't know. It's really confusing. People think they got it all figured out. People will come on here and tell me they're detailed into E. And then they'll go on and say, like, therefore, Life is like this and life is like that. And I'm thinking, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, this is what you made of it. Because it's like, there's their NDE. And then there's like what we make of it based on what we read and what we watched and what we believe in our culture. And Yes. Um, I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah. Well, Peggy, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed uh, sharing my experiences and I, I hope they're inspiring to people. They're really, you know, my, my experience is that there really is a loving God who has compassion and um, who is at the center of things and who is in control. And, and I understand him uh, to be somebody who uh, he's our creator and he allows us free will. So we get to co-create with him. And, um, I uh, I just wanted to share that and uh, thank you so much for this interview. And I'd, I'd like to invite people to contact me if they want to make a comment or if they have a question. And um, I believe you're going to publish my contact information. Um, you want your email on there? Yeah, my email. I announced it. My email is leslie at salmoncounseling.com. And I can also be reached on Facebook, Leslie Salmon Counseling Services. And uh, I'd love to hear from some of your viewers. I would especially uh, love to hear from people who live in Arkansas who are looking for a counselor because I am a licensed mental health counselor in Little Rock, Arkansas. And, uh, you know, would, would love for some of those folks to reach out to me if they'd like an open-minded therapist who can uh, treat mental health issues as well as uh, spirituality issues. All right. Well, thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Peggy. Bye. Bye.